Welcome back to the news hour. Let's take a look at some of the stories making the news. With me to review them here in the studio are presenter and historian Tessa Dunlop and former professional footballer Mickey Ambrose. Guys, welcome to the studio. Uh, let's start with impeachment, the story everybody is talking about right now. Trump almost certainly going to become the third US president to be impeached by the House in the history books for all the wrong reasons, Tessa. Yeah, he is actually the first president to be impeached for high crimes and misdemeanors. I find, I mean, this, it's a bit of a charade because the House of Representatives, you know, where Democrats outnumber Republicans, they're going to bang him up to the Senate where effectively he'll be tried, but it won't go anywhere because uh, two thirds of the Senate need yeah, to rule exactly. against him. And of course, the Republicans, the Republicans dominate too. there. So the whole thing's going to meet a cul-de-sac or a dead end and he will remain in power. I mean, it's a stain on his character. And it really is a stain in his character. And actually, if we look at the nitty gritty beyond the sort of American theatre, yeah, this is the, pale male, these are live pictures men. coming from that debate oh, right now. Plain, sorry, we're not allowed to objectify men. <laughs> what a plain lot! But beyond that th theatrical spectacle, you know, the real deal on the ground is Trump is being accused of playing a p political football with the Ukraine which is in an incredibly vulnerable position, being sat on by Russia, you know, mm. bribing, trying to withhold vital military funds. But you know, all these uh, allegations we've heard against Trump, he still holds but that massive that's the portion of the population yeah, that no one's yeah. changing their opinions that's about him. Yeah. I mean, to me, he's, you know, he's, uh, he's like Teflon, nothing sticks with him, <laughs> um, if I could put it that way. And uh, he, he just, it's, it's sort of divided, isn't it? You know, and you, whether you loathe him, you don't like him and so on. And I just think that, uh, as you were saying, it's it's taken through well, through the mill. No other. The other two presidents impeached by the House, Bill Clinton yeah. and uh, Andrew Johnson, both of them uh, acquitted by the Senate. We probably all know about Clinton's wrongdoing. Yeah. Do you know why Johnson was impeached? It was 1868 was something about firing a war. He minister. fired his oh. war secretary, okay. which at the time was against the law. Yeah. It, it seems pretty tame when yeah. <laughs> compared yeah. to. But we're in crazy times. But the distressing thing is because we're sort of experiencing insular nationalism, and here too in Britain and actually all over the world, these kind of um, charismatic leaders mm. are, are winning. Uh, they have the opium of the masses within in their own country for people to no longer care what's happening in the rest of the world. You know, the collateral damage that Trump does, it don't matter to redneck America. They're going to stick by their man. Yeah. You know, and there's something profoundly depressing about that. And of course, we have parallels in Brexit Britain as well. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to uh, football. It's not directly football, no. but it's Arsenal uh, midfielder Mesut Ozil, who's yes. come under fire for condemning uh, China's treatment of Uyghur Muslims. He's been defended. Who's he been defended He's been by? defended by, obviously, Arsene Wenger, the previous manager, which is quite interesting because I remember when Arsene Wenger was manager and Arsenal are very strict on the code of uh, conduct and who you speak with. He has to go through certain press things. And I, just, I do find it very interesting. Yes, he's got freedom of speech and everything like that. But, you know, he's won the World Cup. He's a high-rated player. And Didn't you... Arsenal try and distance itself from those comments by Ozil? They, they did, but it's quite difficult, isn't it, when, <laughs> to do that? And, of course, it's their brand. You know, these football clubs, at the end of the season, they go out to different countries to try and sell their brands. But... And the brand's been affected. But is it that surprising that Arsene Wenger's spoken out? I mean, now he's got some sort of ridiculous... I looked up the title. He's FIFA's Chief of Global Football Development. I can't, he's currently washed up in guitar. He's clearly bored. He really misses um, <laughs> his time at Arsenal. Uh, Arsenal, meanwhile, know that they rely on Chinese state television, CCTV. And this is yeah. a problem. The They've already cancelled one yeah. of the uh, yeah, yeah. coverage it's, of one of the scheduled it's matches. It's about money. Uh, beyond the beautiful game, it's always been about dirty money. You know, and Arsene Wenger, of course, is free of that because he's in this cushy little number and he can say what he likes. Mm. The bigger issue is the abuse of human rights that goes on in the Western province, mm -hmm. Xinjiang, mm -hmm. in China. Yeah. And yeah. this footballer, I think he's t of Turkish descent Turkish from Germany, yeah. Yeah. has rightly put and, out and, to his millions yeah. of Instagram followers. In fact, I'm going to follow him today on Instagram. Mm. That's what I'm going to do. He said, this ain't on. And he's right, mm. it's not on. Do you and, know, do you know Wenger, I've Mickey? I've met is a few is times he, at the sort of the PFA Is he the kind of person that. who will rush to defend freedom of speech? Um, I think he would, but I just find it very odd because if he was still manager, these type of comments by players, and you may have a comment about the world politics, but you, once you, you, you air your views and you're with a club like Arsenal or Chelsea or it's Tottenham, tightly it's tightly, it? it is tightly controlled. Mm. So he's got to remember that whatever he says is going to be seen. 
So, and obviously okay. they pulled the game. They're, they're now trying to but do some other things as well. There's got to be some advantages to being put out to long grass. Come on. <laughs> you get All right, to... let's <laughs> let rip. Let, let's move on from football to ballet. Uh, ballet students at the Vienna State Opera have been told to lose weight in a controversial way. Well, Explain. That's my, that's my one, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I did a bit of ballet when I was at... Uh, yeah, they had to. Give us a I, I mean, so <laughs> what, is the, what is the way that these ballet students have been told to lose weight? Well, Why apparently, so apparently they've been told to start smoking. Start smoking. Uh, to, to uh, drink coffee and so on, and, and unfortunately, there's been some quite serious allegations about um, sort of hitting them with rulers yeah, and this, things like the, that. The, this is a, there's a government report into mm. this, um, uh, the, the Vienna State Opera, saying uh, young students have been mentally and physically uh, mistreated, and so yeah. much of young people's mental health is wrapped up in their self esteem and, and, and their appearance. So, this yeah. seems particularly cruel. Yeah, it's I find it very cruel. And, and with the smoking, obviously, you want to be fit, you've got to be agile, you've got to. Yeah, good, good cardio. So it is a, an interesting uh, point that's been put. And, to and also, you know, I, you're a sportsman. Mm. Ballet is a is, is a discipline. Um, smoking really yeah. goes against yeah. any kind of athletic. Me. No. But the whole kind of the abusive aspect of mm. the regime that these ballet dancers have to go through doesn't surprise me. And if you look, at all the great gymnasts throughout history have tended to come from communist regimes. I mean, mm. Nadia Comaneci, we're about to talk about Romania, yeah. was possibly the most famous, wasn't she? Nadia I mean, they're, Comaneci they're, they're winning in the They're all quite harsh disciplines, and you, yes. you hear yeah. about... You know, get up at five o'clock, yeah. you know, this is do, 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 do sort of thing, and yeah, they're, they're very disciplined. Uh, but, uh, and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the people who do them, like gymnastics and ballet, very young, you mm. know, So there is young there's always a fine yeah. line mm. between excellence mm. and, and, it sounds, an abuse, really. Yeah, because well, what, I mean, a child doesn't always know what's best for it, so they may go along went with over it. that line. Yeah. So, which yeah. uh, let's talk about Romania, Tessa, because this month is the 30th anniversary of the Romanian Revolution. Has it moved on from the shadow of Ceausescu? Well, funnily enough, Romania, I kind of shot my lifetime bullet into Romania. I went there when I was 18, just out of okay. school, to work in one of the orphanages. And I've just been back for the BBC, in fact, to cover the revolution and how much has changed in 30 years. I think. Romania tends to be given a really hard time in the press, certainly here in the West. You know, it's the whipping boy of Europe. And it's got this frozen image. We think of Ceausescu, the crazy dictator, right. the execution, the orphans, gypsies. You know, there's always kind of, it's framed in a pejorative way. And actually, I just want to sing it for Romania because they're the fastest growing economy in the EU. Mm -hmm. um, they are one of the few countries in that part of the world I'm comparing them with Poland and Hungary, who are not tacking hard to the nationalist right. If you think of Orbán's Hungary, all that ethnic nationalism, mm. they have absolutely embraced the European project. And one of the interesting things is why? Why is Romania exceptional in this way? And it's, I think it's partly because I had a really interesting discussion with a historian out there. You know, their revolution, unlike the others, was bloody. Over a thousand people died on the streets. Yeah, there was no accountability. The yeah. Then there were miners bashing up the demonstrators six months after the revolution. People very much feeling in the 90s that that revolution was hijacked. And don't forget, before the revolution, Ceausescu broke with the Soviets. So it was a nationalist communism. Romania's fed up with nationalism, mm -hmm. okay? It has, ever since those dark days in the 90s, it's had a culture of protest. Ever since a bunch of corrupt dudes take over power, and they do frequently, those kids are out on the streets, and it's delivered results. They've yeah. got the, 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 they've just been knocked out of power, but the ruling party's um, leader is in jail now. You know, there's a real spring in so the So do step. you think it's uh, moving forward? I mean, you, yeah, you said you were there the, the, recently. Do you know, and it's mainly because there's a massive, the big problem for Romania is brain drain. They've got massive yeah. diaspora, right. but they come back and they help in these protests. There's a sense in Romania we ain't gonna let you imperil our democracy. So the politicians mm. have got this heritage of corruption mm. and wrongdoing, but they are consistently coming up against... In 20, 2018, they were the biggest demonstrations in Europe, over half a million out on the streets. Well, that's the question. Are there, yeah. are there many Romanians coming to the UK? Huge numbers. Because you, you've got Huge. Lithuania, you've got all the different... Uh, they Polish. are the second biggest foreign nationality right. in Britain. And right. that, okay. you know, we, we use them as a whipping boy for Brexit. Oh, we don't want immigrants. They, if you go to Romania today, there are adverts to work in the English NHS. Okay. We are stripping okay. them, and there's nobody to work in the hospital. Uh, no, so you're, uh, mm. so, there you so go, so Sheila. Do you have something there. to say about Romania? I don't, in no. fact, could <laughs> you give me an hour? Uh, let's move on <laughs> very quickly. <laughs> final story. A woman yeah. has beaten a man at darts for yeah. the first time in the PDC Championship. What do you make of that, Mickey? Is I, it, I, does that seem unusual? 
Oh. Not really. It's uh, one against one. How do um, you, you stand and you chuck me, something? Well, how, how is a woman not oh, be she, equal no, no, to a man in she, that? There, there is a technique to dance. You've got to get it through those little Is that areas. what the men say? Triple 20. No, you've got to hit certain, <laughs> certain but it's figures. Accuracy. It's uh, accuracy. Surely a woman is as accurate as a man of when course, it comes to things like that. Now, I mean, there's no know, speed or strength involved. I mean, we've just no. moved on from needlework to dance. I think darling is a sign of progress. <laughs> we should be a natural. But Indeed. I think as well, you know, it's, 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 the, you know, it's the temperament, the tension. But it's f great news. I mean, I just think she was great. Um, she hit the 6 This is Fallon Sharon. And apparently, Fallon Sharon, yeah. uh, the championship only allowed women to qualify last year. Yeah, so there yeah. may be many more yeah. women yeah. And growing dance. And this dance. the one sport you can smoke and drink and do what the heck yep. you like, eh? <laughs> she doesn't fit the, the stereotype of a dance. No, she doesn't. Does I mean, the good, thing is, the good thing, I think, is, you know, the FA used to sort of ban women from playing football back in the day. Um, the PFA used to actually ban my friend, who was the first female football agent in this country from going to the PFA walls. And it's great now that governing bodies are embracing women's sport. Brilliant. And let's get the girls out there. Do, Guys, do, we're going to have to leave it there. We're running out of time. Thank you, thank you so much.